Well, um, I, I've been reading you. You seem to like what the Cardinals did. Uh, well, you did like what the Cardinals did in terms of uh, reinforcing that rotation. So, so take us through it. Tell, tell us what you liked um, and uh, what maybe uh, you like but you're not crazy about. Anything like that. What, what do you think they need? Just go right through it all. Um, take all the time you want. Well, considering it's December 1st, I like what they have done to this point. Uh, if this is the extent of their off-season plans, that's a different conversation um, when the spring training rolls around. But I think, you know, they, they had a big task, right? You know, I mean, John Ozalek put it out there. Before the season was over, we need to add three starters. And then you started to look around baseball and think, well, there are lots of other teams that need to add two starters and a lot of teams that need to add one starter. And even though there are lots of starting pitchers available this off-season, the, the need doesn't meet – or the, the availability doesn't meet the need. So they're going to have to do something. So I think in moving quickly to get Lance Lynn and uh, Kyle Gibson and Sonny Gray, they have addressed the base problem, which is they didn't have any innings. At least theoretically, they hope that this group of five starters will be better in the first inning than last year's group of five starters were. I'm not 100% convinced of that, but at least they – uh, seem to get at the, the root issue was, they, was that they just didn't get enough out of the starters. That said, the rotation as it's set up right now, A, as everyone knows, it's, it's older, right? When Stephen Matz, who turns 33 early next year, is the youngest guy in your rotation, you're counting on a lot. And that seemed like that was kind of the problem with last year's rotation. They were counting on a lot of things to go right. Now, maybe the what-ifs this year aren't quite what the what-ifs, last year were but i just would be afraid that they might have gotten to this point and think okay we're good now but the reality is is there are a lot of impact guys that they can go out there and get and yes they added sunny gray to the top of the rotation but miles michaelis didn't pitch like a number two guy last year steven Matz didn't pitch like a number two guy lance lynn pitched like a guy who you know was lucky to get picked up uh, after he started off so poorly Kyle Gibson was great for what he was, but he's a number four or five guy at this point in his career. So there are lots of number two and three guys out there they could go and get, and there is not a single person in that rotation outside of Sonny Gray that should prevent them from going out and upgrading if that's something they feel that they can do. And so to this point, I love what they've done. You've built yourself a little bit of a cushion. you bought yourself a little bit of time. Um, let's see what they do going forward with that. And then, you know, you've got to do something with the, the group of outfielders. I think you need some more clarity, some more certainty. And that means trading away a couple guys. And to be quite frank with you, in some cases, I'm not sure that it matters what you get back. Just the, the certainty in dealing away certain players would, uh, would help the club going into spring training. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, uh, and they – they really need, and I'm telling you, of course, what you already know, and I think our listeners know too, but I want to reinforce it, is that they really need, they need to be aggressive about upgrading that bullpen too because I th- yeah. my, my concern is that they're going to overestimate what they have or they're going to get one guy and they're going to be, oh, well, you know, oh, we really like our bullpen. They seem to be in denial about Gallegos, who we all agree has been a fantastic reliever, but last season – there was a big drop in his strikeout rate. There was a big increase yeah. in his hard hit rate. Uh, the left-handed batters started started punishing him. Um, I, I, you don't know. None of us know how mu- how mu- how much uh, Ryan Helsley will be available because he's he's not a durable closer that way. And even when they got him back I, after that two and a half month absence with the forearm. Um, there were days where they had him on the card available, and you know, right before the game, he'd say he's not available, and they never knew whether, you know, day to day, you know, what what he what he was ready to do or not prepared to do. So, uh, you know, if they, if their ideas are going to go get one guy and a name a name brand guy, let's say, and then oh, okay, we're good now, I don't think so. You know, so that's my next concern. I agree with what you said about getting a higher caliber starter as well. Do you um, – listen, I think the Yamamoto stuff is, is, is ludicrous. I, there's, I, there's no way Bill DeWitt's going to – I don't know why people in our town uh, torment themselves thinking that that's a possibility. It's not. 
not going to pay that kind of money. Uh, nothing in his history ever t- has ever even remotely suggested Bill DeWitt will. However, they do have people to trade. And, uh, you yeah. know, if we're, if we're going to do the fantasy trade thing, Dylan Cease is a really good fit for the Cardinals, but he's also a really good fit for a lot of teams. Um, how do you handicap that? I mean, who, what, what teams do you think are going to go hard after him in a trade with the White Sox? And do you think the Cardinals have what it takes if they're willing to, to make that happen? Well, I think they absolutely do. The question is, is what are they willing to do? You know, I think everybody kind of looks at um, – I think some Cardinals fans look at their – the players they like to trade and say, we'll give you four of these guys that don't fit here. And you give us your best pitcher who's under club control for two years. And it just doesn't work that (laughs) way. Right. Because not only then are you taking the players that didn't fit here, but then you've got to cut some of the other guys in your system that are basically the same players that you just traded for. Right. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I think if they want to get in that seriously, get in that conversation, you've got to start including, you know, better prospects right pink hence needs to be available guys like that need to be available because you can trade a couple of good young major league players and then add that and make that as a difference maker you know to kind of push yourself over because like you know dylan sees you know lots of teams are going to come after him and they're going to continue to come after him because like we talked about there are more there are more needs for pitching than there are pitchers available right so at some point, when it gets down to the last couple of players, you know, it's like you do like a, a fantasy auction draft, and the guy that goes in the last round goes for five times what he should because everybody sat around and waited, and all of a sudden you'll pay whatever you, you need to to get this guy, right? So it's kind of in that same situation. Um, so you're going to have to you're going to have to make it worth the while. You, you're either going to have to do that early or late because with you know new, Chris Getz, the new guy in charge of Chicago, he's not going to trade his premium pitching piece, this first big trade he's going to make as the decision maker in Chicago, he's not going to trade them for pennies, right? He's got to win that trade. And if you feel like Dylan Cease is the guy that is perfect for your organization, for what you're doing right now, you're going to have to pay that price. You know, and you talked about Yamamoto and, uh, and I, I think that could get crazy. You know, quite honestly, the number for that is going to be way more than he should get because of who's involved and because of the desperation of those people involved. I mean, the Giants are chasing him hard. You know, John Morosi from MLB Network tweeted that out. They wanted either Otani or Yamamoto. That's what they had their hearts set on this year. And good luck, right? Because right. the Yankees also need to do something. The Mets need to do something. The Red Sox need an ace at the top of their rotation. So you've got these big money franchises that are going to go hard after him. And, I mean, this isn't even the David Price. This, he's going to get, like, Max Scherzer numbers, maybe more. He's probably going to get the second largest contract for a pitcher ever. After He's not going to get close to what Garrett Cole got. But he's going to be second on that list, almost certainly. And that's, I mean, quite honestly, that's, that, that's crazy. Somebody is going to massively overpay for him. Right. That's what it's going to take to get him in the rotation. For the next five, six, seven years. Yeah, no, no doubt, and it's just uh, you, you got to be ser- uh, seriously uh, disconnected from reality if you even think for like even like a one centia of uh, of belief that the Cardinals uh, Bill DeWitt's going to jump in that pool and go for it. it it's just crazy. It's not going to happen. Um, who do you? Um, I, I, I think it's interesting that you brought up Tick Hens because I, I actually agree with you and I've come around on that because uh, I'm not trying to, to uh, belittle him or anything because he's obviously got a lot of talent. Yeah. He's turned some heads, but the Cardinals haven't pitched him all that much. They seem to – I appreciate the fact they're conservative. They don't want to risk injury, but they're kind of pushing him along slowly and slowly and slowly and – you know, I, at this point, it's like we know he's got talent, but it's like when is he going to be ready to pitch? When when are they just going to let him sort of go? And so part of me thinks, uh, you, you know, that's a guy that you it, it, that's candy. You could probably really attract a lot of people interested in him. So uh, if if you want a starting pitcher or for whatever need it is, I, I agree. I think he should be in play, but uh, they may they may feel otherwise. Uh, but I. Yeah. I, I, I 
I appreciate what you said about that. Yeah, and it's because he's good. I mean, it's because they need something. They need a difference maker because they're not going to trade Mason Wynn and they're not going to trade Jordan Walker, which they shouldn't. They absolutely no. shouldn't. Um, so you have to you have to do something other than a guy who doesn't have a position full time in the bigs. You just have to do something, and he's the guy that seems to make the most sense there. Ryan Fagan, our good friend and such a such an excellent baseball writer, columnist, has been for the Sporting News for a very long time. Lives here in St. Louis, and follow him on Twitter at Ryan Fagan, F A G A N. Um, I only keep you a couple more minutes because I know you got uh, things to do, or you got to get ready to do some family things. But um, how big of a player do you expect the Cubs to be? Because I, I think we all expect them to, uh, you know, really, uh, really let it loose. I, don't, I just don't know how much though. Are they going to go all in, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it, the, the the only scenario that I can't imagine happening is they go the entire off season and the biggest move they make is adding Craig Council. Like that was a that was a I mean, that was shocking, right? It's the first time I sitting ever sat there refreshing Twitter to figure out what a manager's going to do, right? <laughs> um, right? But that's not going to be the biggest move the Cubs make this off season. It's going to be trying to go all all in after Shohei Otani. It's going to be trying to trade for Juan Soto. Um, you know, it's going to be something like that, or it's going to be something we didn't see happening, right? Like Craig Council, you know, some guy that maybe they target and say, they say, we're coming after this guy, and we're going to make a team an offer they can't refuse in terms of a trade. I could see something like that happening as well. But, you know, I, I feel like they uh, signal to everyone their intentions – on changing the way the franchise has been operated, which the last couple of years, which is, you know, not quite competing, you know, this, to this 2023 season was a nice little story. They had a nice little run. They got into contention and they were there late. You know, quite frankly, you look at that roster and if they're going to be legit contenders for the world series, there's six or seven guys from that team that can't be there, right? They've got to make upgrades if they're going to be the type of team they want to be. And by going out and paying Craig Council all that money, convincing him to leave Milwaukee, uh, sure signaled that they were ready to do something. To me, the most likely seemed to be Otani or Juan Soto, um, but, but we'll see. Uh, the two, two, two more quickies, and both have to do with the NL Central. Well, actually, one doesn't. I don't know what I'm saying unless an NL Central team <laughs> acquires them. Uh, or signs them, but uh, with the Brewers, um, do, do, is your sense that they're they're they're, they're reluctant to just kind of indicate or tell their fans, you know, we need to rebuild? This is this is the long way of, of saying. Do you expect them to trade Cor- Corbin Burns? This would be the year, but uh, are they are they going to play it uh, too safe? Are they going to try to compete? I don't know what to make of them. Yeah, you know, I think all, all this this talk we've heard the last couple of days about uh, them signing their mega prospect Jackson Trio to uh, a long-term contract, even though he's only played six games over uh, above double a, that sure seems to me like the move of a franchise that's about to trade away a couple of popular guys. Right. Cause you know, you see him talk, you see people talk about maybe they'll make a run at it and they'll see where they are at the trade deadline. And then they will, at that point, if they're not winning, they'll trade Corbin Burns and Willie Adamas, you know, maybe a couple other guys, but those two specifically because they're free agents after the year. But what happens if you get to the trade deadline and you're a game in first place, but you know you're going to lose those two guys? You know the franchise needs to get value for those two players more than just a draft pick, which isn't even as high as a comp draft pick used to be you've got to get more value for those two guys when they leave because you're not signing them to long-term extensions. So I think part of the thinking is they just ripped the Band-Aid off now, right? I mean, this is a franchise that traded Josh Hader in the middle of a pennant race when he was the best, you know, well, he was struggling that year, but he was still one of the best closers in baseball over the last several years. They made that move, and it wasn't popular, and trading Corbin Burns is not going to be popular. Trading William Adamas is not going to be popular, but if you're talking about giving some of that money already to a kid who's played six games in AAA, it sure seems to me that that's just setting up 
um, the fan base to say, okay, well, we're not going to win this year. But right. we're still committed to being a good team. See, we signed this guy long term. We're, we're not going to let this happen again. It just doesn't seem like a move you'd make if you plan to uh, go be a- aggressively contend for the division this next year. Ryan Fagan, one more, and I promise. Um, what's the market for Blake Snell? I'm, we all know that there's at least some reservations about him in terms of you know how how many innings he'll give you and. His, his really high walk rate, but he is the Cy Young yeah. Award winner and had the lowest ERA. Uh, what's the market? Is it going to be um, less than expected? About what's expected? Is anyone going to go nuts and, and really just kind of blow everyone out and give them more than we thought? What do you think? Uh, I think it's going to be robust. I, I think it's going to take a little bit of time to develop because I think when you look at all of the starters that are left on the market – it makes the most sense for him to wait until Yamamoto signs somewhere because you're going to get all these teams ready to spend a lot of money. And then when they don't get Yamamoto, all of a sudden they say, okay, well, we didn't spend $220 million to get Yamamoto, but maybe we will spend 175, 180 to get Blake Snell. And maybe all of a sudden he looks better at that point. Plus there's the level of desperation that's going to kick in because there are more teams that want aces than are aces available. So, you know, unless somebody just aggressively says, we're not going to get Yamamoto, we realize that, let's get Blake Snell now, and let's make him a good offer. I still think, you know, even though he doesn't check some of the boxes that we're used to checking for starting pitching, um, I mean, he did down the stretch, you know, he threw six innings pretty much every time he started. He's not a five-inning guy, right? He's a six-inning guy, which isn't the seven- or eight-inning guy. I realize that. But he's not, you know, he's not four, four and a half innings every time out. He's pretty much a six inning guy, and he led the league, like you said, in ERA. He led the league in, you know, the Baseball Reference version of WAR. And he's still a really good pitcher, and he's got two Cy Youngs under his belt. That's a pretty good resume boost. So, yeah, he's gonna get, he's gonna get a lot of money. I'm not sure he's gonna be worth every penny of it, but he's still gonna get a lot of money. Ryan Fagan, thanks for doing this, man. Uh, I'll, I'll continue to read your stuff as always, and we'll have you back on again soon. If we don't talk before Christmas, uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family. It's never too early to extend those holiday greetings. So thanks thanks for all the times you help us. We really appreciate it. I'll always enjoy the chat, Bernie. All right. All right. It's, our, it's such a good guy there, man, Ryan Fagan, and he's excellent at what he does.